Hello, this is Rob Schreiber from Cerebra Systems. Today I'll be talking about wafer scale hardware for machine learning and beyond. We have a crisis in computing, the end of Moore's law. Uh, as you know, Moore's law was all about a growth of the number of transistors we could put on one square millimeter and that growth was exponential with time. Uh, with the end of Moore's law, we need alternatives and the wafer scale approach takes the alternative of increasing dramatically the number of square millimeters per chip. Cerebrus has been building wafer scale systems for a number of years. Uh, we now have realized our second wafer scale implementation. The wafers are uh, about 210 millimeters square. They uh, uh, now contain over two and a half trillion transistors, uh, which is 50 to 60 times larger than the largest GPUs. You see an array of dyes, they're all identical, created by reticle flashes with space between them. That's what's on the wafer. If we compare the characteristics of one Cerebrus second generation wafer to the largest GPU today, the NVIDIA A100, we see that uh, there's a 56x increase in size and 123 times as many compute cores. Um, the Cerebrus wafer is half memory, all SRAM, and the total amount of memory on the chip is a thousand times greater than what a GPU has. The real win for being on the same chip is that both memory bandwidth and inter-processor communication bandwidth are uh, so much greater, one cannot conceivably achieve those bandwidths any other way. Uh, the memory bandwidth, as you see, is 12,000, 13,000 times what the off-chip memory bandwidth of the GPU is. And similarly, uh, uh, in the 10,000s, uh, improvement in the ratio of uh, inter-processor communication compared with chip-to-chip -chip communication. The Cerebra system is packaged uh, in this way as shown. The wafer is a very small component in the upper right hand part. Uh, on the left, you see both air handling and water handling equipment. The wafer is water cooled, the water flows to a heat exchanger and that heat exchange, water in the heat exchanger is cooled by air blown through it. The total power of the system is about 20 kilowatts. Uh, there are a lot of interesting aspects to wafer scale, uh, what we did, why we did it, and how we did it. Let me talk a little about the how we did this. There were a number of serious problems, uh, the most interesting ones being the cross wafer connectivity. Uh, and the yield, uh, the power and cooling issues were quite important, but I won't have time to talk about them today. Similarly, the issue of dealing with differential thermal expansion of silicon and other components. Concerning the connectivity, as I said, the wafer is covered by identical reticle flashes making die, each die is a large array of identical processors. Uh, traditionally, the wafer is cut along these scribe lanes which separate the die. Uh, we didn't want that to happen because we had other plants, namely wiring between the die. Uh, and in conjunction with TSMC, we developed a way to do that. This provides us with uniform bandwidth across the wafer. There's no less bandwidth between processors on adjacent die than there is between adjacent processors of the same die. 
Yield is a serious question. We know there will be defects in the wafer and those defects will re render some of the processing elements useless, such as the one shown in black. In every die, we have a redundant extra row of processors at the top and another one at the bottom. The machines interconnect. A structure is a logical two-dimensional mesh, but the physical implementation involves eight-way, not four-way communication, including links to the diagonally adjacent processors and Two things allow us to route around a failed processor to restore a logical mesh. One is to bump up and route to the processor above so that uh, it becomes logically the one that's in the place previously physically occupied by the failed black square using one processor from the redundant row. Secondly, the North-South connectivity is able to be used uh, to route through the defective processor and maintain connectivity in that direction as well. Uh, with this, we're able to yield very large fractions of the whole wafer as a working logical 2D mesh. So, uh, our first system was created and announced two years ago, and we've been delivering these systems, and they're in use in the field for over a year. Uh, so we've established, yes, we can build working wafer scale systems. Very interesting, important question is, what did we choose to put on the wafer? I'll describe that uh, briefly. Um, first of all, we don't have any off-wafer memory in the system. We have an IO connection to host systems, but we don't have external DRAM or any other kind of external memory. So all of the memory of the system is on the wafer. Uh, how much on the second generation, 40 gigabytes. We made an enormous number of very small, but powerful process, identical processors. In the, the second generation machine, there are over 800,000 of them in this logical 2D mesh. It's a distributed memory architecture, taking a hint from uh, what is now the, the proven um, best method from high performance computing. We have shared nothing. These processors are completely independent, MIMD, they have only their local memories. They send messages to one another when they have to communicate. Uh, we have a power efficient general purpose processor core, uh, 800,000 of them. So on the wafer, this enormous level of parallelism gives us huge peak compute. Uh, in the petaflops, we have spectacular memory and communication bandwidth. It's now conventional that data movement is the consumer of energy and the bottleneck in high performance computing. Not true on the wafer. We have order one ratios of memory bandwidth to compute bandwidth and interprocessor communication bandwidth to compute bandwidth those memory and com walls within the wafer have disappeared. We have spectacularly good flops per watt, largely driven by the fact that we, when we send bits on the wafer, we're spending only femtojoules, not picojoules per bit. Uh, and as I said, we have 40 gigabytes of the local SRAM memories. Uh, this was all designed to make for very efficient, fine-grained, massively parallel computing. How do we use this? Well, the primary use case is to train neural networks or to use the wafer for inference on a pre-trained neural network. In fact, you can load a network, train it, and then leave it in situ on the wafer and use it in inference mode. When we do that, 
we currently typically map a layer of the network to a rectangular subregion of the wafer. So you see these rectangular blocks in the picture. Each of those corresponds to one layer in, in this case, the AlexNet network. We call the rectangular block a Colorado. We have interconnection in the X, Y directions within Colorado's to implement issues or computations like convolutions, matrix vector or matrix, matrix multiplication and whatever else that layer entails. And then we have longer distance routing of communication through the mesh between Colorado's that communicate in the neural network. Uh, an illustration of these long distance routes shows that while much of the communication is sort of in a nearest neighbor mesh manner, there are routes that make right angle turns in various places that are used to connect Colorado's that weren't placed immediately contiguous in the wafer. We have developed a sophisticated compilation stack that includes many layers, including the place and route stack that achieves good utilization of the, uh, of the compute fabric. Um, we are exploring other strategies in addition, ones that don't necessarily place one copy of the model on the wafer. They may do one or several layers at a time, or they may place multiple copies uh, uh, of the model on the wafer and use them in a data parallel manner. All of that uh, different software options are uh, under investigation. This one that I've described is the primary use, use modality. What are the systems in the field being used for? Uh, we have quite a few systems in use today in national labs and uh, supercomputer centers and uh, in various industrial sites. One of our first customers was Argonne National Laboratory who are using the system among other things for work in the candle project. That's the uh, uh, cancer um, uh, research investigation involving deep learning. Uh, and uh, one of the most significant problems is the supervised learning uh, for estimating drug response for cocktails, uh, combinations of drugs and various cell lines, all with the goal of prioritizing the most uh, promising possible therapies for experimental investigation. Um, this uh, has been uh, used quite successfully and achieved the significant speed up over what was possible with earlier hardware. We have a, another system in use at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the context of a model of inertial confinement fusion, uh, which is a very complex simulation done on the uh, largest supercomputers uh, Lassen's, uh, Lassen is their biggest supercomputer or has been until recently. Uh, they have interconnected the Cerebra system into Lassen so that it can be used to replace one of the components in that multi-component uh, simulation with a neural model for what happens uh, at the atomic level uh, to uh, model the reactions between um, uh, atoms and subatomic particles uh, using a pre-trained neural network. So it's used entirely in inference mode. It's invoked at every time step of the big iteration and the uh, data are streamed from, the, from Lassen's nodes to the Cerebrus unit, which provides the predicted interactions that are needed and can achieve a significant speed up uh, that way. Uh, to get into use cases that go beyond machine learning, I'd like to speak in some detail about uh, an experimental 
investigation we did with Nettle, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, who have a large supercomputer called Joule based on CPUs and GPUs. Um, and they're doing computational fluid dynamics using uh, implicit time stepping methods. And they have linear systems to solve at every time step on large regular three-dimensional meshes. Uh, what happens on the cluster with these messages is that there is a difficulty in scaling. And even in the, before you hit the scaling limits, there are difficulties due to memory bandwidth. So you can see the time it takes for an iteration of their solver by conjugate gradient stabilized as a function of the parallelism for a fixed mesh size. This is a strong scaling experiment. On the right side, you see a loss of speed up, a failure of strong scaling, which is what we're all familiar with. But even on the left side, where you do see linear speed up with increasing processor count, the performance is severely limited there by the memory bandwidth. Uh, so we, we did a port of the spy conjugate gradient stabilized method to the Cerebrus. And we are able to remove both the scaling limitation and the memory bandwidth limitation. And I'll show that work now. So what we're doing is mapping a three-dimensional mesh to the Cerebrus system, which is interconnected with a two-dimensional mesh. We use the obvious, for a fine-grained parallel system, we use what's obvious for us and wouldn't work in a cluster. Namely, map a one by one by n piece of the mesh to each processor. So we lay the two dimensions of the computational mesh out in a fine-grained way over the two-dimensional machine. Uh, and then each processor only has a one-dimensional Z-oriented um, vector of data points. To implement biconjugate gradient stabilized or any other Krylov subspace iteration, we need a few subkernels. We have to do neighbor exchange where the processor owning a grid point needs the data of the neighbors of that grid point. That's shown in the left-hand panel. We have to do vector uh, XP operations, y equals y plus alpha x, uh, where these are distributed vectors. The way we do that is to make everybody, all processors aware of what alpha is, and then they do this XP operation on their local chunks of x and y. And finally, we to compute alpha and related scalars, we have to do dot products of the global vectors. That entails a local dot product on every processor, and then an all reduce across the entire machine. So we have the, the all reduce operation that you see on the right. Let's talk about the inter-processor communication for the, the matrix vector product, the neighbor exchange. So what we're doing is sending the local vector, the Z-oriented in-memory vector, to each of the four neighboring processors and receiving from each of those four processors their local vector. To do message passing in this machine, we don't use MPI. Message passing is done entirely in hardware. There is no uh, uh, external interface such as a PCIe. It's right in the instruction set of the machine is the, the use of the, the interconnection hardware. Uh, and we don't send messages to particular destinations. Rather, we send messages along virtual channels that are pre-rooted at compile time. These are called colors. So for example, every processor sends its vector out, looking at the processor in the middle, it sends that vector out on the color that appears to be yellow on my screen, which is routed to each of the four neighboring processors. It also receives four different incoming vectors on the colors lavender, blue, red, and green from the four processors. 
And we've done an assignment of colors to processors and directions in such a way that at every processor, these five colors suffice to bring in the four neighboring vectors and send out the, the one local vector. This uh, uh, hardware-based communication means that we achieve bandwidths of one 32-bit word per clock. The latency of communication to neighbors is one clock per hop. Uh, so it's hard to imagine doing any, any faster than that. The all reduce exploits this fine grained high bandwidth uh, to achieve a, a very interesting all reduce result. Uh, we did these experiments on the first generation machine, which was a six, roughly 600 by 600 mesh. And clearly the diameter of that machine, 1200, is a lower bound on the number of clocks it's going to take to do an all reduce. We're able to achieve that very, or with something very close to that. And the strategy is to accumulate uh, the scalars involved by sending them to neighbors in the east-west direction, moving towards the center of the machine. So on the left side, we communicate to the east. Every time a scalar arrives, it's added to the local scalar and the sum is sent to the, to the processor on the right. Uh, these, uh, we have a little movie sort of illustrating this happening on the sides. These data move to the center when they arrive at those two columns in the center, those columns reverse uh, roles and they begin the same process, but moving towards the center in the north and south directions. And finally, the sums of one fourth of the processor values arrive at the four processors in the center who do a little neighbor exchange, a four way all reduce, and they have the final result. They then broadcast along the routes shown in red so that everybody gets the data. And we're, we're able to do this cross machine all reduce in a little over a microsecond. That's about the time it takes to send. Uh, one word uh, to one processor, uh, one neighboring processor in a, in a modern cluster as an MPI message. Finally, the, the computation. Uh, the computation is done so as to achieve the full machine bandwidth, regardless of the, any delays that you see in bringing the data in. The, the, there are four N words coming in. They're all streaming in simultaneously. The uh, rate at which we can absorb them is one, one per clock. So what, what's shown in this picture is a conceptual diagram of how the local code works. It involves uh, memory vectors shown in gray, such as at the activations, that's the, the grid point data, uh, and the uh, weights that are used to multiply the various shifts of the, of the grid point data. The, those are the matrix elements, such as X negative weights. We have the router on top and the four vectors streaming in on different colors shown as X minus X plus, et cetera. We stream out the, the local data uh, on the red color. We also cause the router to route it back in. That way we can use it multiple times without having to pull it out of memory more than once. We launch various threads. This is a multi-threaded architecture in a certain sense. It can run multiple threads in the background while running one main thread in the foreground. And those background threads are activated when data are available and when the data path has an idle cycle so that they can make progress in the background. Those threads do things like multiply memory-based weight values with incoming data point values. They stream their results into this uh, thread eight, which wakes up every time there's something for it uh, and it, simply adds a, a product into an appropriate location into the final result in memory. 
So what we have basically done is to create in software with the assistance of this multi-threaded multi uh, parallel hardware, a data flow uh, implementation of that sparse matrix vector product. The result is that we can achieve, we achieve a good fraction of the maximum speed up, maximum performance. Uh, we wrote this code ourselves in low level languages to access all of the hardware features. We know that customers are going to want to write their own code. We're in the process of creating a software development kit for writing your own customized kernel operations. It's a DSL, domain specific language with abstractions of the various low level single node uh, uh, architectural features such as these FIFOs and threads. Uh, it'll have uh, library support for communication, for uh, math functions, random numbers, and so on. There'll be a debugger, a hardware simulator, uh, and documentation. And the expected arrival uh, of this thing is September 2021. 22, yeah, 2021. Well, what did we achieve with Nettle? Um, so on a larger mesh, 600 cubed, they were able to get by scaling up to 16,000 cores on the order of six milliseconds per iteration of by CG step. Our implementation, which actually was on a 600 by 600 by 1500 mesh, got it down to 28 uh, microseconds. So we're roughly 200x faster than the cluster. And they're beginning to hit the limits of strong scaling, largely we think due to the all reduce and the fact that that all reduce does not scale well. So uh, we get this large speed up, uh, strong scaling. Uh, the power consumed is maybe three orders of magnitude less per, per unit performance. Uh, and uh, there's considerable saving in cost as well. And so what we find is that with this technology, because of the way that it's eliminated the various memory and communication bottlenecks, we have restored the possibility of strong scaling and fine-grained parallelism, which opens very interesting possibilities. Uh, uh, Nettle uh, find, found these to be compelling. Um, uh, there are, you know, in the field, in situ utilizations of simulation such as the ones listed here that become feasible when you can do real-time computation uh, by virtue of strong scale. In addition to those real-time possibilities, there are just simply benefits due to the, to the absolute performance that opens up the possibilities of design optimization and uncertainty quantification that would simply be too expensive without it. So let me summarize our findings concerning the, the ML and beyond. We're, we're achieving amazing results in ML, and we're finding that there's considerable promise for uh, achieving things that can't be done any other way by using wafer scale hardware in broader high performance computing contexts. Uh, last June, there was a, an amazing paper in CACM by Lyserson. Kuzmal, Emmer, and, and others uh, talking about there's plenty of room at the top, uh, a way to go beyond Moore's law by looking at improving software algorithms and architecture. And we're certainly embracing all of those things, but our point is there's also room at the bottom. Way for scale computing is a, a really good example of what can be done in hardware as we approach the end of Moore's Law. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. That's the end.